with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Our passage today is 1 Corinthians, verses 50 through 58. First Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh God, we thank You for this marvelous promise that You have given us that one day we shall put on the imperishable. And we ask, O oh Lord, as we consider the word that You have given us for this morning, that You would bless our time in it. Encourage our hearts in Your truth, O oh Lord, and give us hope as we live our daily lives. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It's a simple fact that the simple questions we ask as children often are the questions we continue to ask as adults. Simple questions have profound answers. And about a month ago, we looked at a very simple question. Where have we come from? And today, we will look at another simple question. Where are we going? Now, throughout history, men and women in all of time have answered this question at least partially in agreement. Mankind is inevitably going to the grave. Everyone can agree on that. Where we disagree is what happens after the grave. And how we answer this question not only determines our future trajectory, but also invests our past and our, our present with meaning and significance. And Paul addresses this question in our passage this morning. And in doing so, he addresses the profound doctrine of the resurrection of the body. And he says that this is actually something, if we're going to believe the gospel, we have to believe in the resurrection of the body. To truly believe in Jesus and his work, we must hold to this doctrine. Our bodies will change from being perishable to being imperishable and free from sin. And since we will be raised with an imperishable body, we are to live a steadfast and immovable life, abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, to understand Paul's argument, though, we must first realize that there is a more fundamental problem than just death itself, namely the problem of sin. Death's sting is sin, and so we must first and foremost be rescued from our sin. Now, the Corinthian church, when Paul is writing, has famously fallen into a lot of problems. They have fallen into practices that are so sinful that even the pagan world is astonished by them. 
but they've also fallen into worldly ways of, of thinking, into worldly ideas. And one area in which they were thinking in a worldly manner was with regard to the resurrection of the body. Now, it's not an understatement to say that the ancient world of the time would have generally found this doctrine hard to believe. After all, this is one of the doctrines that in our own time is rather difficult to believe. This is one of the doctrines which the atheists will point to and say this is just absolute fabrication. This is just fairy stories to believe in the resurrection. But the ancient world had an extra hurdle to jump over in order to, to believe in this doctrine. Because particularly in, in the Grecian world, many of them didn't just believe resurrection was impossible. They believed that it was undesirable. Uh, some of their greatest thinkers like Plato and Socrates taught that the physical body was actually the soul's shackle. It was keeping the soul from reaching its full potential. And so to, the Greco, to much of the Greco-Roman world, if you told them that they were going to be resurrected in their bodies, they say, why? I don't want that. But Paul contradicts this entirely. He says that to deny the resurrection of the body is to deny the gospel. And the reason for this is that this, this doctrine of resurrection shows us the link between death and sin. Sin is the cause of death. When Adam and Eve were created, God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for upon the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And sure enough, when they ate the forbidden fruit, while they didn't die on that day physically, they did die spiritually. And they eventually, their body caught up with their soul. Death is caused by sin. But not only that, death also leads to more punishment. We read in verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. There is a real sense in which death gives power to sin. And the implication of what Paul is saying here from the rest of Scripture is that dying in sin dooms one to eternal condemnation, to the eternal and just wrath of God. Now, why does sin bring God's wrath? Well, sin brings God's wrath because it is the breaking of His just and righteous law, which He has revealed in some capacity to everyone. We are, of course, fortunate that we have His law in Revelation, special Revelation. He has uh, caused it to be written down and explained to us in the Bible. But everybody, to some degree, knows God's law. Paul says in Romans 1 that God's power and sovereignty is evident in the works of nature. We can look at the world around us and see that there is a special way we are supposed to be living. What is more, we're created in the image of God, which means we have a conscience. We know just intuitively that some things are right and some things are wrong. And yet, despite this knowledge, we still break the law every day. We act against our conscience. We do things we know we shouldn't. And so we stand condemned by the law we are given and by the law that we know. The power of sin is the law. The law condemns our sin and leaves us without excuse. And so, in considering this, we see that man's problem is actually twofold. Not only is he going to die, but death is a result of sin which condemns, which condemns him to God's eternal just wrath. You see that there. We're going to die. Secondly, that death is going to bring us into eternal judgment. And we can't help sinning. We can't avoid it because naturally we are born in it. That's what Paul says in Romans 3. No one does good, not even one. It's what David says in Psalm 55. In sin did my mother conceive me. He's not saying that he was an illegitimate child. He's saying that even in conception, he was a sinner. 
He was one who hated God and was walking away from Him. And so, because of that, we can't help ourselves, friends. We have no ability to redeem ourselves. We need someone to come and rescue us. Hence, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reason why Christ had to become man. He had to be identified with us. He had to become man so that He could take man's sin and so that He could take man's punishment. And now, if you believe on His name, you are united to Him through the power of the Holy Spirit so that when God looks upon His Son on that cross and pours His wrath upon Him, He sees you. And He sees that that payment is finished. It is done. When Christ said, it is finished, it is finished for you. The death you owed our Lord has been accomplished. And furthermore, because you are united to Christ, when God looks at you now, He sees the perfect record of His Son. And just as Christ rose again from the dead, so one day your mortal bodies shall rise to immortality. That, in brief, is the Gospel. And it undergirds everything that Paul says in this passage. And so, if you are here today and you are not believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not repented of your sin, if you have not renounced it and turned away from it in faith in Christ, you need to realize your dire situation. You are not just approaching death as bad as that is. You are approaching the never-ending wrath of God. And when Christ returns, you will be resurrected. Death is not a permanent state, despite how it looks. But you will be resurrected not to glory, but to spend eternity in hell. But if you repent, if you put your faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins to Him, then God will justify you he will see His Son in you, and your sins will no longer condemn you. You will rise with Christ to glory. Now, for those of you here who have believed, who put your faith in Christ, your call today is to remember. It's to remind yourself. It's to meditate and to stand in these truths. Be immovable. Be on guard against any doctrine which compromises this one. Any doctrine which tells you that this body doesn't matter or this body is evil and we should be ready to shed it just for the sake of shedding it is a doctrine which compromises the Gospel. It is a, it is a doctrine which is anti-Gospel because the Gospel is a promise of the redemption of the whole man, body and soul. Denying this doctrine will cause you to answer the question, where are we going incorrectly? And that has serious implications for your life. Specifically, you will not know how to properly relate to this world and walk in sanctification. And it is to these two subjects that we will focus for the rest of our time this morning. If you would, uh, please look with me again at uh, verses 50 and following. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does, the imper nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed." These verses introduce us to a theme which we've already touched upon uh, previously, namely that we are currently perishable. And so we are not to invest our hope in this world. Paul draws a distinction between the life that we have now versus the life which we will receive in the future. And this is important because life as we know it now is perishable. 
It is flesh and blood, as Paul says, which cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you've read through Romans or Galatians recently, you probably know oftentimes when Paul talks about the flesh, he's not talking necessarily about our physical bodies. He often has in mind our sin natures. It's uh, something of, of imaginary language, if you will, or symbolic language. Well, here in our passage this morning, that's not what is happening. When Paul talks about our flesh, he is talking about our physical bodies, our physical flesh and blood. Now, doesn't this contradict what I just said earlier when I said that the gospel is supposed to be the salvation of body and soul? Doesn't this contradict everything Paul has already said in chapter 15? Well, obviously no. Paul is consistent. He's not an idiot. He's, he's linking our flesh and blood as we know it now to the concept of the perishable because that's all we've ever known. We only know perishableness. And he's doing this to highlight the difference between the first creation and the new creation. Between what is now and has been and what will be. In the first creation, God made everything good, including man. We saw that a month ago when we looked at, at Genesis chapter 2. But when man sinned, God pronounced a curse. From dust you are, to dust you shall return. And this is why our bodies inevitably break down and die. But the life of the world to come will not be like that. Our resurrection bodies will not pass away the same way they do now. They will be immortal and imperishable. And amazingly, that same truth extends to the world around us. Right now, the world as we know it is summed up in the wonderful lines of the old hymn, change and decay in all around I see. Not so in the new world. And so, brothers and sisters, we must not set our minds on the ways and things of this world. And by this, I mean we are not to place great value and invest all of our love in the perishable. The Christian should be known for a heavenly-centered mind. The mindset of a pilgrim or a traveler in this world. Someone passing through to get to a better place. And this naturally means that we're going to have different priorities from the rest of the world. We're going to grow older. And we're going to be okay with that. We're going to seek maturity. Our, our time right now is one in which people are grasping desperately for youth. Thousands and thousands of dollars is spent every year by people in order to make themselves look younger than they actually are. We prolong immaturity well beyond our childhood years all the way into our adulthood so that we now have it as an idea that the ideal old person is someone who acts as if they were still a kid. We see this portrayed in movies and all kinds of things. But brothers and sisters, the Christian spirit does not value these kinds of things. Of course, it's not bad to make ourselves look presentable. It's not bad to try and, and look good within reason. We steward our bodies, yes. They are a gift from God. But we know where we're going. As Christians, we're supposed to seek maturity and wisdom because our hope extends beyond this world. A life which is desperately trying to cling to what you have right now and to keep it is a life which doesn't have any focus on the future world. Furthermore, the Christian is going to have modest expectation, uh, expectations about this world's institutions. Right now, I'm sure you're all well aware, we are in the middle of an election year. And for the next several months, we are going to have to wade through all kinds of promises which politicians make 
that they will be able to make the sun come out in the morning. That we are finally going to enter utopia, and we're going to have the greatest condition we've ever, ever known. And this is on both sides of the political aisle. But brothers and sisters, as believers, as those who read God's word, we should know that not only are these politicians passing away, not only are they finite human beings, but even the governments and the societal institutions that we look to have an expiration date. They have limits. So yes, we still seek the good of the state. We still try and, not at all, uh, we still try and, and uh, make sure that our communities are well kept. We participate in elections and seek the good of our nation so that coming generations will ha uh, have a better country than we did. But we also know that no human being, no human institution will ever be able to solve every problem. There will always be breakdown somewhere. There will always be challenges which the next generation will have to contend with. Because no matter who you're thinking of, whether it's a senator, a representative, politician, a, a president, they're all going to go. They're, regardless of whether they're life-termers or merely there for four or eight years, they're going to die, they're going to leave their seat vacant. There is only one king whose reign will have no end. And he promised us we will have trouble in this world. But we can take comfort that he has overcome the world and secured our future in his kingdom. Look back with me at verse 51 again. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Notice in, in the first verse I read there, verse 51, Paul begins by addressing the Corinthians directly. He's talking to them specifically. But then he, he switches to the first person plural. We. And this is significant because Paul is not, in, in making the switch, merely referring to the Corinthians as well as himself. He is talking about every Christian through every age of the world. He's talking about you right now and anyone who will come after you to sit in these pews. <laughs> we shall not all sleep, he says. Uh, by this, of course, he's saying not every Christian will experience death. Sleep is a, a euphemism in Scripture oftentimes to refer to death. And it's not used in a way to suggest that death is a kind of soul sleep where our souls become unconscious until the resurrection. What it's doing, actually, is, is stressing the impermanence of death, the fact that death is a temporary condition. So Paul is saying, we shall not all sleep. Not every one of us shall die. Those who are alive at Christ's return will be transformed without dying like some of the Old, taints, uh, Old Testament saints we know, most famously probably Elijah, who is never recorded to have died. Instead, went up in a chariot of fire. However, it's safe to say that the vast majority of Christians, uh, at least uh, all the Christians past and present, as far as we know, the vast majority of Christians will experience death, but not all. Those who are alive when Christ returns, whenever that may be, it could be tomorrow, it could be a thousand years from now, those Christians will not experience death. But all believers will experience a radical change. As mentioned before, the bodies of living and dead saints will be transformed into imperishable bodies. Christ delivers that which the world feebly tries to, comp 
to, to, uh, to grasp with its industry of youth. This promise actually goes beyond even the promises of the world for eternal youth and beyond even the state of Adam and Eve before the fall. Because in both those states, while death and sin may not have been a reality, it was at least a possibility. When God created Adam, of course, we, we know he created him without sin. But he was still capable of sinning. But since we are united to Christ, death no longer dooms us to God's wrath. And we are looking forward to a time in which we will receive a body that is not capable of perishing. And we are looking forward to a time in which we will no longer even have the capability to sin. And in that sense, we will be like God in a very good way. The imperishable body will be fit for the kingdom which is eternal. And so Paul's quotation then naturally follows in, in verses 54 through 55. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? When we are resurrected, the sting of death will be completely removed. Even now, it's already blunted. As we've seen, Christ is the conqueror of death. He's already defeated it. And since we are united to Christ, death no longer dooms us to God's wrath. Instead, when we die as Christians, it causes us to ascend where our Savior is. After we die, we will no longer have any problem with sin and we will dwell in God's presence, awaiting His return and the resurrection. So in that sense, the Christian no longer experiences the sting of death because death is what ushers him to the presence of his Savior. But there will still be a time, an even greater state to come, in which our bodies are restored and death will have absolutely no sting. A time in which we will no longer suffer decay, nor mourn the loss of our brother's and sisters who have departed us. Now, it may be tempting to think, in light of all this, that this perspective means that our actions on this world don't really matter. But Paul says the exact opposite. Our actions on this earth have meaning because we will be resurrected. Look with me at verse 58. Therefore, in other words, because of the resurrection, because we're going to receive the imperishable, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Since death will be defeated, there will be no good deed that goes unrewarded. And so, brothers and sisters, we abstain from sinful pursuits, not because we're killjoys, not because we just want to ruin other people's fun. We do not sacrifice and persevere through suffering because it's either that or just dying. No. We resist temptation. We make sacrifices, and we persevere through suffering because we are united to Christ and will rise again. We put sin to death because we know that there is a greater joy beyond the, the, the promises of this world in obedience. There is a joy which never ends. We suffer loss and we mourn now because we know that none of it will be worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. And so, brothers and sisters, rather than cruising through our Christian lives in apathy, we must rouse ourselves. Does your life currently show the hope of resurrection? Are you approaching the various callings that God has given you in the knowledge that He has given them eternal significance? 
or are you apathetic? Parents, are you raising and discipling your children not merely to be citizens of this world and this earth, but to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven? Are you training them in the acts of that kingdom, in public and private worship? Are you bringing them before their Lord in prayer? Are you teaching them to praise and honor His name? Sons and daughters, and I mean of any age, are you growing in the faith that you have been given? Are you showing honor to your parents as God has commanded you as a way of showing honor to Him? For those of you who are single, are you pursuing chastity knowing that because your body is united to Christ, it is a temple of the Lord? All these callings and any other which you may have, as difficult and as futile as they may seem now, have tremendous, have tremendous significance. God is using your life now to prepare you for heaven. And these are some of the means in which He is doing it. Therefore, let us be faithful in our Christian lives and in our Christian walk as those who have a sure and unbreakable hope. For as we have seen, the Christian is going to be raised with an imperishable body Just as Jesus was raised with a glorious body which will never undergo death again, so we will be raised. And this truth is where we find hope because it will never fail. If we understand that, then we will find true meaning as we approach our various callings in our daily lives because God has given them purpose in light of eternity. God's eternal purpose gives significance even to the most mundane elements of our daily lives. So with that hope, let us go to our Lord in prayer.